They're not really, they don't even want to be aware that security exists or let alone do anything about it. Now, some of these technologies that were first um, created for military purposes, we can see them around. So, for example, GSM phones um, use some kinds of frequency hoppings to avoid um, actually bands that are used by microwaves and such things, not actually to avoid being intercepted. ADSL modems use at their base uh, some form of uh, direct sequence spread spectrum. Actually, it's uh, uh, with orthogonal codes, which is, again, just to avoid interference rather than uh, have covert communications. And um, some uh, products also use uh, meteor scattering, which is this burst communication technique, uh, to provide cheap communications in the desert and such things. A key reference for all that is actually Ross Anderson's book, Security Engineering. He has a whole chapter on military techniques. But of course, we're not really that interesting on military techniques, because um, we leave that to the people who are in the army. We're interested about the internet. And the internet is not quite as hostile as uh, the military ne networks. Uh, of course, you know, it's used for commercial purposes, people use it, governments use it, it's sometimes part of the critical infrastructure, and even the military use it, so sometimes it is actually quite sensitive, but overall, you know, if there are attacks on the internet, usually no one gets killed. Um, of course, it's a confederation of networks, there are different jurisdictions, but I guess that doesn't need uh, in this audience to be explained. Lots of different transport technologies, so we can't really think that there is just one technology. And there are basically what defines the internet is a set of common routing protocols, the IP uh, protocols. And what is interesting about them when it comes to traffic analysis is that there is no protection of the routing information. Okay? So if you have an IP packet, you know where it came from, you know where it goes. If you send an email, um, the to and from address are there, it, and that basically goes on for all the established protocols, okay? So, to a first approximation, most of the traffic analysis techniques should work fine. And these networks, the internet network protocol networks are not actually uh, protected at all. And on top of that, because some people believed a few years ago that, well, you know, you can't really eavesdrop communications anyway because they are in a router somewhere in the backbone, uh, new technologies make that really possible because, of course, everybody's using wireless now. The encryption of wireless is so-so, particularly when I wrote this slide, it was pretty much broken. Um, everybody is using peer-to-peer -peer and overlay networks, which means that your communications are getting relayed over other people that can see all your traffic data, who's talking with whom, who you're talking with, in clear. And um, so there are just many more opportunities to collect data. And um, at some point, we will have to start thinking, what kind of information is uh, this traffic data leaking about us uh, that is so easily accessible to everybody else? And of course, it's not just the case that you need clever mathematicians to, uh, to look at this uh, information, let's say, to extract uh, um, intelligence about you, because once someone writes a script or a good application that do, does traffic analysis, then everybody can run it and everybody can just see the, re see the results. You don't have to all start from scratch coding um, and m not making it, basically. Okay? So, there is one particular interesting... Um, let's say, technological trend, which is that telephony nowadays is going to more and more be based on IP. And uh, for many years, law enforcement has been very interested in knowing who's talking with whom. This is how they, they hunt um, organized crime and uh, terrorists and all that stuff. So now it's going to become an issue on performing this kind of uh, intelligence gathering on the, uh, the Internet as well. Okay? But... Before going too much into this kind of high-level gaining intelligence, let's see how one could use, in practice, um, traffic information in order to break quite established security protocols. Oops, I'm going back instead of forth. Okay. So, everybody, I guess, here is using the secure shell protocols, and um, everything is encrypted. The cryptographic handshake ensures that uh, you're talking to who you think you're talking, so everything should be fine in theory. It's, uh, it's the best of the best protocols. Uh, but of course, traffic analysis can still leak some information. Now, imagine you connect at home and then you further type a password to access your mailbox or to log in into other systems. Now, what is happening? Every time you press a key, basically a packet is generated that is perfectly well encrypted and sent back to your server. Okay? And of course, it's quite 
trivial to, to think that depending on the position of the keys on your keyboard, it takes you a slightly different time to press consecutive keys, okay? So O and P maybe are very close to each other, so it's a short time. Uh, Q and W are the same, but Q and P are not quite that close, and therefore the intertiming will tell you something. And this leads to an attack by, that was described by Song and All, and uh, they observed basically the intertime delay between consecutive keystrokes and managed to basically not completely break the password you were transmitting, but reduce enough the uncertainty of this password to be much easier to brute force and crack. Okay? So here we see a really traditional security protocol, open, uh, open SSH or a secure shell in any uh, invocation of it, um, a really classic security property, namely being able to protect the privacy of your passwords, and an attack based on traffic analysis, i.e. looking at the patterns basically on the network of the, the packets that symbolize the keystrokes, managed to violate this property. Now, Rubin and all further notice that different people have actually a different pattern of typing. Okay? So fundamentally how you type is very much like your face or like your voice, it really characterizes you. So they say that, um, they say because I've actually never seen it running, um, they say that they can create good models of your typing behavior, and again by observing you, for example, composing an email over Pine, uh, if you connect uh, through SSH to a terminal and use Pine, um, they can actually tell who you are. So even if you think you're anonymous, uh, just because you you know, logged in into a system that everybody in your university is using and basically because you use SSH, no one can really see who you are and all these things. Uh, it's not quite the case because um, the timing of your uh, keystrokes will actually betray who you are. So this is about SSH and um, let's look a bit at uh, web security and SSL. Now, many uh, websites, as you know, uh, will use SSL in order to hide your patterns of behavior. So let's say you're accessing some medical information website. Um, some of the pages you're accessing might be perfectly innocuous. You know, they're going to be talking about how treat, to treat symptoms of the flu. Other pages might actually uh, be slightly more compromising. They might be talking about sexually transmitted diseases and the fact that you start browsing those pages if it was made public, clearly indicates that you have an interest in this uh, field and maybe leaks information about your state of health. So many websites, of course, choose to encrypt all the traffic to make sure that no one can uh, tell which pages you are uh, browsing, the simple flu ones or the sexually transmitted diseases ones. Now, there is a whole line of research. Um, I just mentioned two papers here of Hintz and All and Simon and All, uh, that basically says, well, SSL really is hiding the content of the communications, but it's actually not disturbing much the timing of the requests and the replies from the website. And it, it is not also disrupting very much the length of the packets uh, that are being sent from this uh, website. So if you are going to receive an image, for example, from this website, it's padded a bit down to hum the block size, basically, of the cipher used. But, you know, no more than that. And um, this line of research basically what they do is they browse a lot of websites, they create profiles out of these websites, and then they look at encrypted SSL connections, and just from the intertime of the packets and the resources that you use, they can infer, according again to their research, um, which websites you are browsing, and which particular resources on a particular website you are browsing, despite the fact that it is in an SSL connection. So here we have SSL, and it's not really helping your privacy very much, as one would think when they see the little um, key chain thing on the browser. Okay? Now, I have myself done a bit of research on, on this field, and um, what I have found is that very often, and this was actually the subject of my talk uh, the first time I talked at the CCC, very often looking at a single request doesn't give you much information. Uh, pictures have roughly all the same size and all these things. So one can actually have more sophisticated statistical models of how web pages look. And by looking at a consecutive set of requests, because users will mostly be using links to go from one page to the other, um, they will be able, you are actually able as an attacker to track much better which pages a, a user is accessing. Okay? So using SSL to hide your uh, web clickstream is just not effective against uh, traffic analysis attacks such as these. Now, 
some people have actually argued that this is not technically speaking a traffic analysis attack, but I'll present it anyway because it's just cool. Um, now, sometimes a website may have an interest in finding out which other websites you have visited. Okay? And of course, you're not going to tell them because you like your privacy. So there has been a whole sequence of attacks devised that could actually infer that. What they do is they embed within the page of the site they control, okay, that you're, you've just gone to, a set of resources from the other website. And they rely on the fact that modern browsers uh, perform quite a bit of caching, particularly when it comes to images. Uh, and then, basically, time, the time it takes you to load the resources from the website um, that they would like to find out if you have already accessed. If the time it takes you is quite long, it means that actually your browser is going to this other site, fetching the images, and displaying them to you. Well, in fact, they're not displayed. They're just a one pixel by one pixel um, on the browser, which you cannot see. But if the time it takes your browser to load these images is actually quite short, it means that they were locally cached, which leaks information about the fact that you have already browsed this website. Okay? So if you're Microsoft, let's say, uh, you would like to find out if uh, the user that is right now browsing the Microsoft.com website has already browsed the Apple website, then you just embed some resources and check the timings, and you can basically get quite accurate readings about the fact that they have been looking at your competitor's site. Okay? And the interesting thing is that anonymizing proxies don't really help in this case because they don't really change the caching properties of your browsers. And if you do change the caching properties of your browsers, it's going to be pretty slow. So the attack is quite robust, and it was actually uh, proposed by Felton and all. Now, it's not quite a traffic analysis attack in that you don't really look at the, the traffic on the wire per se, but it still uses the same kind of techniques of remote um, observation that are used in lots of traffic analysis attacks. This is why it's relevant. Now, let's move into uh, the realm of identification here. It's quite an interesting thing, both for um, people doing law enforcement or for people who try to attack networks to understand how networks look like inside NATs, outside NATs, behind firewalls, and all these things. So the first question that might be interesting to, to ask about a network is how can you find out if two different network addresses, two different IP addresses that maybe you're talking to or maybe are accessing some of your nodes in a, in a distributed system are actually the same machine? Maybe it's some hacker that tries to masquerade as two different machines or two different people um, to perform an attack. Okay? And this is actually something that Stephen Murdoch has talked at great length uh, previously here, so probably I don't have to go into huge details in this audience about it. But people at Kaida, who are a network monitoring uh, kind of research group, have observed that uh, computers have particular quartz crystals that have a very specific drift. Okay? And each computer has a crystal with its own drift. And, um, what they do then is they send ICMP echo packets and also TCP um, packets with a timestamp request to find out what the remote time is. And then they just try to detect how the two different machines that you try to establish, if it is the same one or not, have their clocks drifting. And after some time, they're able to basically say, no, these clocks are drifting independently, at which point they conclude that the machines must be different. Or they're drifting at the same pace. Okay. And then they make a statistical judgment as to whether it is actually significant enough to be the same machine or not. Now, this attack was, uh, ex well, was explored to kind of ridiculous length by uh, Stephen Murdoch, who's able to basically pinpoint now if hidden services in Tor are the same machine as some other machine you're accessing in the internet. And I refer you to his paper and talk uh, to find out uh, if your machine is hot or not. Um, now, th there is the inverse problem that sometimes you'd like to know. You have a single IP address, let's say, that is accessing your site or you know, you're interacting with. And of course, this single machine could actually be a gateway or a NAT and hide behind it multiple machines. So you'd like to know how many machines are there behind this IP address. Okay? Now, Stephen Bellovin, who's a 
security expert, quite renowned, uh, has pointed out that quite a few uh, TCP IP stack have a very particular property, which is that their uh, IP ID field, which is a, a field in the IP header that allows you to actually fragment and defragment IP packets reliably, uh, 